Venus most likely used to be covered with oceans, from 30 to 1,000 feet deep. Also, some water was locked in the soil of the planet. On top of that, Venus had stable temperatures of 68 to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which, you have to admit, was quite pleasant and not that different from the temperatures on Earth nowadays. So, what I'm getting at is that for 3 billion years, right until something irrevocable happened 700 million years ago, Venus could have been habitable. But now, it's not. The Moon is the second brightest object in our sky. At the same time, among other astronomical bodies, it's one of the dimmest and least reflective. Our natural satellite only seems bright because it's so close to Earth. For comparison, our planet looks much brighter when you look at it from space. It's because clouds, ice, and snow reflect way more light than most types of rock. Triton, Neptune's moon, has all its surface covered with several layers of ice. If this satellite replaced our current moon, the night sky would get seven times brighter. Neutron stars are some of the smallest, yet most massive objects in space. They're usually about 12 miles in diameter, but are several times heavier than the sun. Oh, and they also spin about 600 times per second, far faster than your average figure skater. Saturn is the least dense planet in the solar system. It has one-eighth the average Earth's density. And still, because of its large volume, the planet is 95 times more massive than Earth. A transient lunar phenomenon is one of the most enigmatic things happening on the moon. It's a short-lived light, color, or some other change on the satellite surface. Most commonly, it's random flashes of light. Astronomers have been observing this phenomenon since the 1950s. They've noticed that the flashes occur randomly. Sometimes they can happen several times a week. After that, they disappear for several months. Some of them don't last longer than a couple of minutes. But there have been those that continued for hours. The year was 1969, one day before Apollo 11 landed on the moon. One of the mission participants noticed that one part of the lunar surface was more illuminated than the surrounding landscape. It looked as if that area had a kind of fluorescence to it. Unfortunately, it's still unclear if this phenomenon was connected with the mysterious lunar flashes. Trash isn't just a problem in Earth's ocean cities and forests. There is a thing called space junk, which is any human-made object that's been left in space and now serves no purpose. There's also natural debris from meteoroids and other cosmic objects. There are currently over 500,000 pieces of space debris orbiting the Earth at speeds high enough to cause significant damage if they were to collide with a spacecraft or satellite. NASA does its best to track every single object to ensure that missions outside Earth can reach their destination safely. Our Sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. The Sun's temperature is hotter than the surface of a star. The surface temperature reaches 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the upper atmosphere heats up to millions of degrees. If someone could dig a tunnel straight into the center of the planet and out the opposite side, and you were adventurous enough to jump into it, it would take you 42 minutes to fall to the other side. You'd speed up as you fell, reaching maximum speed by the time you reached Earth's core. After the halfway point, you would then fall upwards, getting slower and slower. By the time you reached the opposite surface, your speed would be back to zero. Unless you managed to climb out of the hole, you'd immediately start falling again, back down or up to the other side of the planet. This trip would go on forever, all thanks to the weird effects of gravity. Hey, might be a fun way to spend an afternoon. There might be more metals, for example, titanium or iron, in lunar craters than astronomers used to think. The main problem with this finding? It contradicts the main theory about how the Moon was formed. That theory says that Earth's natural satellite was spun off from our planet after a collision with a massive space object. But then, why does Earth's metal-poor crust have much less iron oxide than the Moon's? It might mean the Moon was formed from the material lying much deeper inside our planet. Or these metals could have appeared when the molten lunar surface was slowly cooling down. 
Or maybe, as they've been saying for centuries, it's made of green cheese. Earth could have been purple before it turned blue and green. One scientist has a theory that a substance existed in ancient microbes before chlorophyll, that thing that makes plants green, evolved on Earth. This substance reflected sunlight in red and violet colors, which combined to make purple. If true, the young Earth may have been teeming with strange purple-colored critters before all the green stuff appeared. The highest mountain in the solar system is Olympus Mons on Mars. It's three times as high as Mount Everest, the Earth's highest mountain above sea level. If you were standing on top of Olympus Mons, you wouldn't understand you were standing on a mountain. Its slopes would be hidden by the planet's curvature. Astronomers have found a massive reservoir of water in space, the largest ever detected. Too bad it's also the farthest, 12 billion light-years away from us. The water vapor cloud holds 140 trillion times as much water as all the Earth's oceans combined. What are we supposed to do with that information? Venus spins at its own unhurried pace. A full rotation takes 243 Earth days, and it takes the planet a bit less than 225 Earth days to go all the way around the Sun. It means a day on Venus is longer than a year. There's very little seismic activity going on inside the Moon. Yet many moonquakes, caused by our planet's gravitational pull, sometimes happen several miles below the surface. After that, tiny cracks and fissures appear in the satellite surface, and gases escape through them. Hey, they sometimes escape from me, too. Now Mars is the last of the inner planets, which are also called terrestrial since they're made up of rocks and metals. The red planet has a core made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur is between 900 and 1,200 miles across. The core doesn't move. That's why Mars lacks a planet-wide magnetic field. The weak magnetic field it has is just 1 100th percent of the Earth's. When the planets in the solar system were just starting to form, Earth didn't have a moon for the longest time. It took 100 million years for our natural satellite to appear. There are several theories as to how the moon came into existence. But the prevailing one is the fission theory. Somebody went fishing and caught the moon? Actually, no. The fission theory proposes that the moon was formed when an object collided with Earth, sending particles flying about. Gravity pulled the particles together, and the moon was created. It eventually settled down on the Earth's ecliptic plane, which is the path that the moon orbits. So, looks like the green cheese is off the table now. The largest single living thing on Earth turns out to be a mushroom in Oregon. This enormous honey mushroom lives in Malheur National Forest and covers an area of 3.7 square miles. It could be as much as 8,500 years old. You could be forgiven for missing it, though, since most of it's hidden underground. When the roots of individual honey mushrooms meet, they can fuse together to become a single fungus, which explains how this one got so big. If you could gather all that mushrooming stuff into one big ball, it could weigh as much as 35,000 tons. That's about as heavy as 200 gray whales. Hey, that's a whale of a mushroom. <laughs> the largest asteroid in the solar system is called Vesta, and it's so big that it's sometimes even called a dwarf planet. A trip to the nearest star apart from the sun would take you 5 million years on a commercial airplane. That's what I call a long haul flight. Space isn't supposed to be black. There are stars everywhere. Shouldn't they light up everything around? Well, you don't see stars wherever you look because some of them haven't existed long enough for their light to reach Earth. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds. But get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant last 21 Earth years. Now, some scientists believe that our planet used to have an additional satellite. According to their research, a small celestial body about 750 miles wide orbited Earth like a second moon. It most likely crashed into our main satellite later on. Such a collision could explain why the two sides of the moon look so different from each other, one being heavily cratered and rough. Or it could be the green cheese. 
Venus has more volcanoes than any other planet in the solar system, more than 1,600. And a day on Venus, measured by how long it takes to rotate once on its axis, takes longer than the time it takes to complete a full orbit of the Sun. Wow! And that's just Monday. An extreme greenhouse effect warms the planet's surface up to 870 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead. Winds there reach the speed of 450 miles per hour in the middle cloud layer, faster than the speediest tornadoes on our planet. The pressure on Venus's surface is 90 times higher than that at sea level on Earth. What a great place for a vacation, huh? And recently, this incredible place has become even more intriguing. In the toxic Venusian atmosphere, there's something that might mean the existence of life. Unfortunately, scientists haven't had a chance to collect any microbe specimens or snap any pictures of life there. But they've discovered a chemical called phosphine, and it's a big deal. If it's not some previously unknown chemistry that produces the gas, then there must be a kind of microbial life involved in the process. Phosphine is made up of three atoms of hydrogen and one atom of phosphorus. This gas is toxic to any normal life form that needs oxygen, including us humans. On our planet, phosphine can be found in places with no or little oxygen. For example, marshes and swamps. The gas is created by complex mixtures of bacteria living there. It can also be produced industrially. The weirdest thing is that phosphine isn't supposed to be in Venus's atmosphere at all. This gas needs precise pressure and temperature and tons of hydrogen to form. It wouldn't be all that surprising to find it on Saturn or Jupiter, the famous gas giants. But on Venus? Totally unexpected. There's no way phosphine can be produced naturally on this planet. Tiny amounts of it can be created during volcanic eruptions, lightning storms, minerals blown up to the surface, or meteorites entering Venus's atmosphere. But it's not nearly enough to explain what the astronomers have observed. It would only make one ten-thousandth of the phosphine the telescope saw. But let's start from the very beginning. In 2017, a group of scientists led by Jane Greaves from Cardiff University started to use the James Clerk Maxwell Radio Telescope in Hawaii. That's a mouthful. The main idea was to search for phosphine gas. It would be a sign of life on Venus. When the data came back and the researchers analyzed it, they were shocked. The phosphine signal was powerful. The team checked the results several times. They wanted to make sure no other substance mimicked the presence of phosphine gas. So now, does it mean there's life on Venus? Well, not necessarily. If this gas is created by some mysterious organisms, it's a big question how they survive on Venus. On our planet, some microbes can thrive in the environments with the acidity of 5%, but no more. On Venus, though, clouds are almost entirely made of acid. And even though they have a rather pleasant temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit, these clouds contain more than 90% of sulfuric acid. DNA, amino acids, proteins, life components on Earth would be dissolved there in the blink of an eye. The surface of the planet is too hot for any kind of complex molecules to make up life. The Venusian atmosphere is almost 50 times as dry as the driest place on our home planet. There's a theory that microbes might hide in scarce water droplets floating in the atmosphere, but it hasn't been proved yet. Right now, the research team's waiting for more telescope time. They're going to look for other gases associated with life. But even if they find more evidence, life forms on Venus will be made up of building blocks absolutely different than those on Earth. Or they might be protected by a sulfuric acid-resistant shell. It can be made of such substances as sulfur, wax, graphite, or something else we can't imagine. Of course, some experts question the idea of life on Venus. They think the gas might be produced during some geologic or atmospheric processes happening on the planet. But the supporters of both theories agree on one thing. The discovery is extraordinary. Interestingly, astronomers have always tried to find signs of life on giant planets' icy moons, or even closer, on Mars. But they've never seriously considered Venus. If additional telescope observations and future space missions confirm that phosphine is produced by living organisms, we can be in for a bunch of exciting surprises. Then people would know of a planet with an alien biosphere – well, alien to us – 
and this planet would be just next door to Earth. Now, speaking of visiting Venus, though, would it be possible for people to land on this planet? After all, robots are already tooling around the red planet surface. On the pro side, Venus is closer to Earth than Mars, but it also has much harsher conditions. The planet is hotter than Mercury, even though Venus is almost double the distance from the Sun. The temperatures are higher than the melting point of many metals, and some of them, like lead or bismuth, can fall as snow on the highest mountain peaks. If you set foot on the planet, you'll find nothing but barren rock. Giant basaltic plains are littered with volcanoes and mountains. In some places, the surface melts because of the heat underneath. After it releases some of it, the rock solidifies again. If people ever go to this planet, they will most likely build floating cities in the clouds of Venus's atmosphere. At about 31 miles above the surface, the conditions, like the pressure and gravity, are similar to those on Earth. The temperature is rather manageable, too, at around 167 degrees Fahrenheit. Think Death Valley, California on a really hot day. The atmospheric pressure is half of what we have at sea level on our planet. If you went outside, you'd be fine without a pressure suit. The pressure you'd feel would be the same as at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Plus, this colony would be protected from the sun's radiation better than one on Mars. If the atmosphere was the mission's final destination, landing a spacecraft, or rather making it hover in the air, would look very different. The idea is to use an airship in the upper atmosphere for long periods of time. The airship, wrapped in an aero shell, would enter the planet's atmosphere at a speed of 24,000 feet per second. In the next 7 minutes, its speed would drop to around 1,500 feet per second. After that, a huge parachute would open. It would slow the spacecraft down even more. And then, things would get a bit hectic. The aero shell, not needed anymore, would drop away. The airship would then inflate itself, all the while hurtling through the atmosphere toward the planet's surface. Its speed would be at least 330 feet per second. It would get larger and larger, and its drag and lift would increase. Soon, the parachute wouldn't be needed anymore. The crew would get rid of it, and the airship would fill with air completely. If everything went as planned, it would stop 30 miles above Venus's surface. After that, the airship would travel around the planet. It would be moved by the wind, which can reach a speed of 220 miles per hour at the top of the cloud layer. If you decided to move closer to the surface, though, you'd have to be extremely careful. The wind in the middle layer can get twice faster. The airship could be filled with a breathable mixture of hydrogen and oxygen gases. Such a combination would be less dense than the Venusian atmosphere. It would provide the needed buoyancy, you know, to stay up there. Venus is famous for its super-dense clouds. These clouds make the planet shine bright enough to be seen from Earth. Venus reflects more than 75% of the light that comes from the Sun. This reflective cloud layer exists thanks to a haze of sulfuric acid droplets in the atmosphere. And they gather exactly at the height where the airship would float. Luckily, people already have a method to overcome the problem of acidity. A few materials, for example Teflon and some types of plastic, have an amazing acidic resistance. They could protect the outsides of the ship. So, let's say you needed to work on a platform outside. Then you'd be able to do it, wearing only a chemical hazard suit and carrying necessary oxygen supply. Ooh, sounds like fun, huh? Yeah, me neither. In 2020, scientists studied Venus's surface. This planet has a similar atmosphere to Earth. That's why it's so interesting to people. During studies, they discovered there's phosphine in the surrounding gases of this planet. This substance has organic compounds, phosphorus, with carbon or hydrogen combination. This was an important discovery because the colorless poisonous phosphine may have a biological origin. On Venus, the recent volcanic activity can be a reason for the appearance of this gas. But it's also possible that some bacteria really live there. Now, let's move from Venus to Earth, to the Falkland Islands. Beautiful Gentoo penguins live here. Scientists took samples of the penguins' excretion for studying. In the lab, they analyzed the Gentoo's doo-doo and found phosphine there. This discovery shocked everyone. How did the substance that exists 38 million miles away from us got inside penguins? 
It's hard to believe, but what if these unusual birds came to us from Venus? Maybe they often raise their heads up to see their faraway home in the starry sky. Penguins are rare birds that can turn salt water into fresh water inside their body. There are unique glands next to their eyes that work as powerful kidneys. It allows penguins to remove salt from the bloodstream. So maybe this same gland can help them survive on Venus in some way. Penguins can't fly only on our planet. But just imagine, Venus's atmosphere is perfect for flights. It's possible that millions of penguins are flying on Venus right now. We just can't see them because of the gases covering this planet. Of course, it's unlikely that this theory will find confirmation. Penguins would hardly be able to survive in Venus's atmosphere, which is 96% composed of carbon dioxide. There's also a small amount of sulfuric acid clouds on this planet. But scientists still don't know how the bodies of these birds can produce phosphine. They plan to conduct a thorough study and observe the behavior of Gen 2 penguins. They need to know what the birds eat, what kind of lifestyle they lead, and much more. After the study, scientists hope the penguin phosphine will help identify many different organisms living on other planets. It's possible that inside the penguins, certain anaerobic bacteria produce phosphine to fight other competing microbes. Traces of phosphine can also be found in pond slime on our planet. In the future, scientists are going to send several probes to Venus to explore the planet's atmosphere and find the source of phosphine. There's another animal that may be from another planet. No, not me. This time, it lives in seas and oceans. In 2018, a scientific article was published where a group of researchers stated octopuses were not born on Earth. And this is not a metaphor. They literally call them creatures from outer space. And in fact, there are several reasons to think so. One of the hypotheses says that viruses from other worlds fell into the Earth's ocean and infected squid with shellfish and forced them to evolve into octopuses. Another theory says the octopus's eggs were brought to our planet on a meteorite. All these versions appeared because of how unique the octopus is. These sea creatures are closely related to snails, mollusks, and squids. But octopuses are much smarter. They are the smartest invertebrates on the planet. Their intellectual abilities are also superior to many mammals, including some guys I went to school with. They have one of the most complex nervous systems of all living organisms. Octopuses have a central brain in their body, and their tentacles are endowed with a neural connection that allows them to think separately from the central mind. Their vision is developed in such a way that their eyes can be compared to the lens of an expensive video camera. They can change color and shape, disguise themselves with a combination of color pigment, nerves, and muscles. But the coolest thing is their intelligence. They can relax and do nothing, be lazy, and have fun. No other creature on the planet has such an unusual appearance and behavior. But the main reason to consider them as aliens from outer space is their history of evolution. In any existing animal, you can track its evolutionary stages of development. For example, elephants and mammoths descended from a common ancestor from the elephant family that went extinct 5 to 6 million years ago. If you look even further, you see almost all mammals descended from animal-like reptiles. Almost every animal has a branch of evolution that has made it what it is. Each species changes over millions of years. But octopuses don't have this branch they suddenly appeared on the family tree. From the point of view of evolution, squids should evolve into octopuses in millions of years. But scientists can't track the evolution of octopuses with all their intelligence, their tentacles, and their ability to disguise themselves. The octopus genome is unlike any other genome on the planet. If the outer space origin of octopuses turns out to be real, it could confirm the theory opposite to Darwin's evolution. According to this theory, living organisms, or their embryos, were brought to Earth from outside on meteorites. But for now, there's no evidence to support this theory. Some scientists believe that octopuses separated from the squid line about 135 million years ago. But this theory hasn't been proven either. But if octopuses came to us from outer space, how is it possible that living organisms survived an interstellar voyage? In fact, this is not impossible. There are creatures on Earth that can survive in space. And these are tardigrades, or water bears. 
These are microscopic eight-legged invertebrates close to arthropods. You need a microscope to see them, but even a cheap one will let you see them in detail. From the outside, they look somewhat like bears. They are called water bears because they require a thin layer of water around the body to prevent dehydration. These creatures have been found in all kinds of environments, from the depths of the ocean to hot sand dunes. They are incredibly tenacious thanks to their unique structure. They look soft, but their body is covered with a hard cuticle. This covering resembles the exoskeleton of grasshoppers, mantises, and many other insects. Water bears shed the old cuticle layer to grow. Each of their eight legs has four to six claws, which helps them cling to any surface. The tardigrades manage to survive at a temperature of minus 328 degrees Fahrenheit. This is almost three times colder than in icy Antarctica. Hot conditions aren't a problem for them either. They have survived a temperature of 300 degrees Fahrenheit. This means they exist in boiling water. Water bears aren't afraid of radiation or high pressure. In the depths of the ocean, pressure can destroy alloys of strong metals. The water bear can withstand pressure six times heavier. But the coolest thing is that they can live in the vacuum of space. Our planet has a magnetic field, that is, a shield that protects us from solar radiation. Tardigrades don't care about this radiation. They can go into low Earth orbit and return unharmed. Their body strength is provided by a protein that protects their DNA from ionizing radiation. Tardigrades can also fall into a state of cryptobiosis. If the surrounding conditions suggest freezing, drying out, lack of oxygen, or an overabundance of salt, the tardigrade pulls its head and legs inside the body and falls asleep. It can stay in the form of an unmoving barrel until the conditions around it improve. This state of cryptobiosis allows them to live without water and food for decades. In 2016, scientists managed to revive two tardigrades that had been sleeping for more than 30 years. These creatures have survived five global catastrophes on Earth. They appeared about 5 billion years ago, and it's possible they'll live just as long. They aren't afraid of any apocalypses. Asteroids hit our planet, a supernova explodes nearby, and its radiation splashes out on Earth. A global heat or ice storm starts. People and most living creatures may not survive these events, but the water bears can.